Thank you so much for being with us today. We are uh, again in another of our series, HR Tech Series, and we have the pleasure of having Jason Averbook with us, co-founder, CEO of LeapGen, author, speaker, entrepreneur, investor, anything else we should add to that. But um, really, uh, thanks so much again for um, agreeing to share your thoughts with us today so yeah rich it's great to uh, it's great to be here and i was i as i moved my camera around i apologize i'm moving into a new house and all of a sudden i noticed that socket behind me there <laughs> there there right there it doesn't yep. have a thing on yep. it so i'm like how do i avoid that so uh sorry for that sorry nope. for the uh sorry well, for the it's bad funny visual. Too. it's it's funny too because you see the light coming across and earlier when i was getting ready and just making sure what the backdrop was going to look like. The sun was just streaming through. So it's like, yeah, well, yeah. By the time we're it's done, the new world we live, I can cover it up kind of with it is, do that. How's that. It is that. So anyway, great to be here. Thanks. Let's get going. All right, let's do that. So let's start with the now of work, right? You talk about that a lot. It's all over your website. So um, with COVID, and uh, 2020, what um, kind of new challenges did that pose with the now of work? So one of the things that's really interesting, Rich, about the world we're living in today is that um, where we ended up is the place that we always were going to end up. The question was just how we were gonna get there. Um, and you know, when I talk about the now of work, when we talk about the now of work, you know, the way that we look at that is that you know, right after Y2K, you know, for those of us that are old enough, we remember <laughs> Y2K and very well, well, the world was going to end. Um, and then basically a day or two after that, the world, we realized the world wasn't going to end. And we, we pretty quickly started talking about this thing called workforce 2020. And when we started talking about workforce 2020, and there's lots of books, like if you Google it, there's tons of books on workforce 2020, but the things that Workforce 2020 said is that we were going to start to work more remote. We were going to start to be separated from a distance standpoint, uh, that we were going to look more at global from a talent standpoint. Uh, we were going to use technology to make sure that we were able to get things done in a more efficient and effective way. Um, you know, we were going to use machines as a way to augment our intelligence. And when you think about that, that's actually what happened in 2020. But what, the, what we didn't know, Rich, is that most organizations were, were going <laughs> to enter 2020 not ready for 2020 and all of a sudden have to do it in three months. So, you know, they had 20 years to start to prepare for it. And they really ended up doing it in about two or three months. And that's a huge, huge thing that is really important to understand about this concept. And one of the reasons that I changed the vernacular that I use from future of work to now of work is because what I saw is that organizations weren't ready. Um, you know, guys, let's stop talking about the future. Let's talk about the now because we're missing the mark right now on the now based on what two, you know, two rich pandemics brought to us and a new pandemic, which was the global health pandemic, and then an old pandemic, which was social justice and equity. And I think that the two of those together really hit us on both sides of the head and made us wake up and say, this is the now of work. What are we going to do to take action to prepare ourselves for it? So a lot of people have talked about, and you know, exactly what you said, right? We got to a point where we knew we were going to or have to get to, I don't know, 2023, 2025, whatever that is. And all of a sudden, as you said, that time frame got comp compressed to a couple of months. So I've, I've heard them talk a lot about the effect of COVID. Let's go down that other path that you just mentioned. You talked about two pandemics. Talk about that second pandemic a little bit more by what you mean by that, especially as it applies to work. You know, what, what's really important, Rich, is that, you know, I, how do I say this? I don't want to blame either COVID or some of the things that we saw from a social justice standpoint around that drove the changes to some of our practices. But what 
both of those things did is they made us realize the fragility of life. They made us realize that work and life, that blend really is a blend. It's not a line, it's a blend. And that I have to infuse humanity. I have to infuse humanity into everything I do. Okay, and that's what those two pandemics brought to us are those, those call outs. Now, there are certain organizations that would say, oh, come on, we've always done that. We've always been that way, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, that's all lip service for the most part. But we really saw, and we're seeing in 2021 more than ever before, those organizations that actually talk the talk, walk the walk, and those organizations that kind of, you know, stood up proud, stood up tall during a time of challenge and now have pivoted back to where they were. And that's, that's not saying that either of those two pandemics is over, by the way. Correct. And as far as I'm concerned, um, and I hope no one in the audience takes us the wrong way, I hope that, they, that we keep the pressure on us, okay? I, I want COVID to be a thing of the past. I want social justice and social equities and all of that other stuff to be something that we think about all the time. But we did more for the now of work in six months than we were able to accomplish in 20 years. Um, You're right. You, you hate to say that with all the bad things that resulted, the deaths and everything, um, but some good, there was a silver lining that came out of some of this, hopefully. So as we look, I mean, I, really quickly, I'm sorry to interrupt. There's a no. lot of good. There's a lot of good that came out of this. There's a lot of bad that came out of this, but there's a lot of learning that came out of this. And I think that's what I'd like to emphasize the most. There's good that came out of this. There's bad that came out of this, but probably the thing that I would hope that people would remember is that there's learning that came out of this. And the, the second component that goes along with that is that there's adaptation that came out of this, which is in order to learn, you have to unlearn. And a lot of us had to unlearn a lot of things really quickly about how we ordered food, about you know how we yep. uh, didn't go to the work, about how to use Zoom, you know, I mean, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We all learned a lot of things really fast. You know, my mom, who's 80 years old, you know, who'd never used Zoom before, you know, the fact that we're doing holiday meals on Zoom, you know, she was like, I'm never going to be able to do that. And you know, now she might use Zoom right now as much as I do. So, I mean, just think about that. You know, she had unlearn a tradition and really digitize it. And um, yeah, I think it's just so, so important because it, when we lose that curiosity and we lose that ability to uh, unlearn and learn, that's when we fall behind. And we, we, were, we were quite a ways behind. We were quite a ways behind. So jokingly about your uh, mom and the, us with Zoom, one of the most commonly used phrases in 2020 was, you're on mute, you're still on mute type thing, right? But let, let's talk about that adaptation. So as we adapt, what does the new norm look like? So the now norm. Okay. Um, I'm not going to say the new norm because to me, I, I, I don't, uh, I'm not sure if you've heard the quote, Rich, I'm sure you have, that today is the slowest pace of change that we'll ever experience in our lives. Yes. Okay. That being said, if I think that this is the new normal right now, mm -hmm. And I put that in stone, you know, I'm going to be behind already tomorrow. So I, I, I want to look at the now. I want to understand where we're at now. And I need to be able to start to be pretty good at telling the fortune of where we're going into the quote unquote new or quote unquote future. But this concept of what does it look like? It is much more real time. Okay. If you think about work, in most organizations, the practices that we pop, that we followed at work didn't match the way we lived outside of work. 
So think about that for a second. It's 2021 outside of work. What year does it feel like inside of work? Good question. And just ponder that for a second. So, you know, example, how often do I ask my kids how they are? I ask them multiple times a day. How often do I ask my employees if they're engaged? Once a year. Can I do anything with once a year data? Truly, I can't. Most people saw it as a joke, this whole concept of an engagement survey. You know, if my kid, if I, if my kid says that they're getting a D or an F in their class, what do I do? <laughs> you know, have a conversation with them and help them now. I don't wait for the once a year performance review to deal with their performance and then put them on a probation. I deal with it now. If I go in and want to search to find an answer to something, what do I do outside of work? Go on to Google, type it in, and what do I do? Get an answer. If I am at work and I say, I'm having a baby, what does my intranet or portal tell me? Probably nothing. I probably have to navigate to human resources, the name of a system, menu options. And that's if I know that what a dependent is. So I didn't type in, I'm having a dependent. I typed in, I'm having a baby. So really, when you think through those things, those examples I just gave, you know, outside of work, we're way ahead of the way inside of work works. And the now of work will not allow for that. The now people have higher expectations. It was very easy, Rich, when people had better technology in the office than they had in the palm of their hand. But when now all of a sudden I have these apps that I can do anything with, and then I show up at the office and I say, hey, how do I do that? And like, step one, log in. Step two, log in again. Step three, navigate to here. Step four, log in again. Guess what happens? People abandon and they become frustrated. And when that happens, it hurts their engagement at work. So the now of work is all about real time. It's all about being able to serve the whole person. And it's all about making sure that I'm being able to measure where people are, not just on a, am I monitoring them, but am I enabling them? You know, another key component of this is let's stop checking up on people and checking in on people. You know, let's stop treating people like machines and treating people like people. Let's stop calling people users and let's stop calling them humans. All of those things I've brought up, Rich, are examples of human centricity that's been brought into work as a result of the now of work. So let's let's continue with that thread and talking about checking in with people talking about you know how do i find this out how do i gather that data how do i use that information right so so where does that take us in the future so what it does where it takes us into the future is it takes us into a world that allows us to realize that data i mean one of the things i always say you may love this, you may hate it, is data is sexy. Okay, that's a, that's a unique way of looking at data. It is a very unique way of looking at data, but it's an important way of looking at data because basically, Rich, if I don't have data, if I don't have data, I can't do anything else. This is really true for every aspect of life. And what's really important is that we shift at work from collecting data to thinking about how do we use data? Okay, so let me give you some examples. So I know, Rich, that you live where you live. Mm -hmm. I know, Rich, how long you've been in the workforce. I know where you used to work. I know what you wanna be when you grow up. <laughs> Why am I not pushing content to you that's relevant to you 
based on your current life situation. All those things I just mentioned. Why am I not? I'm not because I don't have that data. I have it here. Tribal knowledge, I don't have that data stored in a way that that data can be used by other systems to deliver that information. It's either siloed, it's in people's heads, or the employees and the managers think, oh, here's just HR asking for more data that they're going to use to police me versus actually help me. Okay. Another example, you know, I go in, here's, you know, my 13 year old, I was watching him the other day. He was doing this eight plus seven minus six plus five, nine plus two plus seven <laughs> plus four plus nine plus eight. Oh, looks at the answer 98. Okay. I said, what are you doing? He's like, my math. I was like, you have to show your work. He's like, what do you want me to do? Take a video of me talking to my phone? I'm like, no, no, show your work. He's like, the teacher said it's not important how to show the work, but what we do with the answer. And I thought that was interesting. I'm not saying whether I agree with it or not. Yeah. I haven't figured yeah. that part out yet, but I thought it was interesting. <laughs> and the reason I think it's interesting is because, you know, if I didn't have data underneath what I was asking this thing just now, what would I get for an answer? Nothing. That's right. I wouldn't get an answer. So going forward, you know, I talk about this all the time. The, the world of data is based on three body parts, hands, heads, and hearts. Okay. What are machines good at? They're good at the hands work, right? What are people great at? They're great at the hearts work. So 98 means what? And where we are today is thinking about how do machines and people work well together. So 98, wow, 98. Hey, did you know that 98 is the average temperature of a human? Yes. And that if your temperature goes above 98 to 99, you might start to have a fever. And if it goes to 100, you probably have a fever. Notice what I did. I just took a piece of data and told a story about it that machine wouldn't have done that. Does that make sense? So I yep. really think data is the key. And if I think of everything I do and think about the concept of data being sexy or data being foundational or data make, ha making sure that I have an anti-fragile foundation so that when I put these really interesting tools like artificial intelligence or bots or speech recognition on top of it, that I can use that data to take me to new places, okay? I call it frosting on top of a moldy cake if I've got bad data. It tastes good for a second. This is really cool that I'm talking to my device and asking it a question. But if the answer that's revealed is wrong or nothing, it's gonna taste bad pretty quickly. Let's talk then about how that data, how that information that they're gathering on me and they're getting it in the flow of my day and the way they should. So they really have started to paint a good picture of me. How can an organization then take that info and all of those pieces and help me with my career path within the organization, the whole reskilling, upskilling, you know, those buzzwords that we hear all the time. So I'm gonna get very um, human about this for a second and then um, we'll apply it. So I've never done this uh, because I'm old, but if you think about, if you look at the stats, one in five people that are meeting today mm -hmm. are meeting their spouse or partner through algorithms. Through algorithms. I didn't say through restaurants. I didn't say through uh, sororities. I said through algorithms. What's algorithm? Math. What's math based on? Data. Okay. So when we think about that, what are those tools doing? They're matching people. They're matching people that have similar interests, 
they're matching people that, hey, based on the fact that these people were matched with these people in the past, they tend to stay together longer. Hey, the fact that uh, Rich loves big trees and Julie loves big trees, maybe I should introduce them. You know, those types of things. Rich, we haven't had those things in the work context the way we've had them in the personal context. Okay, and when we ha when we have had them, people have put too much emphasis. Excuse me, put too much emphasis on them, as if that was the only thing. So, oh, this machine just told me I should date Rich. Do you know who Rich is? I would never date Rich. So, what does the what does the person immediately do? Say the machine's wrong. Okay, so where we are today is we're today to the point, and by the way, what's all that based on, Rich? Data, right? Mm -hmm. It's all based Correct. on data. So back to the earlier comment, if I've got data, I can do amazing things. But what it takes is it takes me as a manager and a leader to use that data, have the machine give me some prescription, some insights as to, hey, Rich would be great for this job or Rich's career path should look like this based on his stated interests, on how he wants to show up at work, or based on how other people in roles like Rich have showed up at work. And I can use that as a guide. I call it augmented intelligence, because mm -hmm. what I'm doing, I'm augmenting my own intelligence with in stuff, visibility that the machine, the data is giving me, pulling from lots of different places. So careers, talent density, the concept of movement of people is more important than it's ever been before. And organizations don't have a good way to do it. Organizations can track how their money moves better than how their people move. You know, organizations can track how their product moves better than how their people move. Um, it's the easiest thing that organizations do is, hey, I need a new X, let's open a rec. More than likely, they've got it sitting right there. Yep. You know, and in today's world, it's becoming harder and harder to find people. Forget the unemployment rate for a second. I totally get that. Every time I say that, someone's like, well, what about the unemployment rate? It's becoming harder and harder to find people with the certain skills that I'm looking for. There's a lot of people out there and there's a lot of people in other, you know, that are either not employed or that are employed in other companies that I should be looking at that I don't have the intelligence to match today. And that's something that in the now of work, I'm going to have to get better at. And then infusing into that, Rich, the humanity, infusing into that diversity and inclusion standards, metrics that I think are that I, excuse me, not that I think, but that I believe in our core components to what my organization stands for. Not let's, let's come up with a list of Rich, Tom, Larry, Bill, and then, oh, by the way, let's apply a diversity metric to it. And hey, based on quota, I should hire Rich. No, diversity and inclusion needs to be infused into every one of my processes and journeys to deal with that second pandemic I mentioned, that old pandemic, justice and equality. So you've talked about the humanity of the data, right? The heart piece of that. Let's go back to the hands piece of that, that the machines are so good at. Um, I mean, in an organization, depending on role, um, there's all those KPIs, there's all those metrics, there's all those quotas that we have to meet, right? Um, what's that data? What's that performance measurement gonna look like moving forward in some of those organizations? So those metrics are, I mean, those metrics are really, really important. And, when we, and by the way, I, it's, as I talk about humanity, you know, I don't mean to, worse, I don't mean to swing the pendulum all the way over to here, you know, where all that matters is humanity. Well, I, I just don't think we've had 
much of that in the past, right? We've always had the, the no. hands part. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Rich, I look back at my management career and, you know, you, what you said I've done in the past, you know, from an entrepreneur standpoint, from an author standpoint, from an investor standpoint, and 2020 made me realize I've missed a lot of stuff. Like stuff that I didn't believe in, stuff that I didn't pay attention to that made me, to be honest with you, feel like an idiot. Bo around both of these pandemics, around both of the fragilities of life, around how I've thought about humanity. You know, I've always been nice to people. I've always treated people <laughs> like human, but I've never done the concept of like, wow, maybe I should really worry about the whole person and their mental health. I you know, should I have thought about that? Yes. Have I as much as I should have? No. So, I mean, it's a huge wake up call, but back to your question about the other kind of metrics, those metrics still exist. And what's going to happen over time is those types of metrics that are what, what, what I call rad, repeatable, auditable, and documented. Mm -hmm. Those are going to be taken over by machines. Okay. Machines are going to continue to get better and better at those things. You know, there's something called RPA, robotic process automation, which basically allows me to become better at those types of repeatable things. Okay. That's going to continue to happen. And those metrics will continue to get, excuse me, will becoming more, will become, we will continue to become more efficient at that type of stuff. We will continue to have better data accuracy when it comes to those types of things so that I can move on to that heads and hearts work. But the metrics that I look at are going to change. So I'll give you an example. We used to measure something and many organizations still do called SLAs. Mm -hmm. And for those of you that don't know, SLAs are service level agreements. Okay. Service level agreements, most of them are based on quantitative data around things like uptime or response time or uh, number of incidents, the truly qual quality-based data tied to these metrics. And one of the things that's really interesting is that as we're moving from a world where those metrics are gonna be really easy to hit when machines are in charge of them, all of a sudden I'm mo moving from service level agreements to what we like to call experience level agreements where it's not as much about, am I meeting the service level, but am I providing an experience that actually makes a person feel or that drives the outcomes that I'm trying to achieve? So, i.e., Rich, when you call a call center and that call center, a call center agent, which by the way, I think they should be called experience center agents, but that's another discussion <laughs> for another Day. We'll put we'll put that for another interview. But a call center agent, what's a call center agent measured on mostly? The number of calls they take. Yep. If I spend time talking about the trees behind you, Rich, how's my metric? It's it's starting to lag. It's starting to lag. But if I care about you as a customer, do you care that I'm asking you about the trees? Yes. Might you do business with my company because you had a better experience? than someone that tried to rush you off the phone. Yes, but how do I, as your supervisor, realize that? And that's by thinking about and understanding how do I put in place the, the balance between efficiency and effectiveness, okay? It's a, it's a fine balance, but those are the, like, that, that's the teeter-totter, efficiency and effectiveness, okay? And, and this, is not, this is not new terminology by any means, mm -hmm. but hey, efficient, I can do X number of calls in an hour. Effectiveness, I can do X number of calls in an hour and get a net promoter score of 9.9, .9. yep. okay? Now, everyone, excuse me, most people know that a higher net promoter score results in increased sales, results in increased share of wallet, results in increased return, you know, to do business with that organization again, okay? So I have to blend the two. And it's one of the toughest challenges, to be honest with you, Rich, and it will continue to be a tough challenge as organizations continue to look at the efficiency that machines can provide. Thinking about how do they take and shift their people 
into Hart's jobs. Okay, let the machine do X, Y, and Z. But then once the machine's done that, how do I finish that? How do I go that extra mile to make sure that Rich wants to do business with me again? Machines probably aren't going to do that for a while, if ever. I don't want to be the one betting on that. And I tell people that all the time. And people think I'm a wimp for it. But you know, I, I, I did a webinar yesterday where I said, when, what's, when do you think the day is that machines replace people? What do you think the average response was? How many years? Um, five to seven. 25. Wow. And I think the answer is never. Mm -hmm. Okay, but the average answer on this webinar was 25. Now, does that mean that people are gonna be doing the same thing in five to seven years? No, people probably are not gonna to touch data entry things. People probably are not going to answer phones. That will all be done through machines. But what people will do is think about how do I infuse humanity? How do I make people feel? How do I drive net promoter score? All of those types of things. And I, at the moment, think machines will help us just like they augment dating. Back to my dating example or matchmaking example. Mm -hmm. But do I think that they're ever going to replace people? I, I personally don't. But it sounds like we're talking a little bit about, or maybe a lot about, um, how roles are continuing to change within organizations, not only change, they always have, but the acceleration of that, right? So the fluidity of what my role is within an organization. Um, a really? lot of what you've spoken yeah. about addresses that. What else, what else would you say about you know, that experience for the company and how those roles are changing? And then that experience for me, the employee within an organization. Yeah, I mean, Rich, have you ever seen on the Weather Channel in the middle of one of these crazy tropical storms where you've got these, you know, brave the standing out there in the wind, men and women standing out there <laughs> holding on to the traffic pole, traffic That's sign. That's right. I love watching that. Everything's blowing away. Mm -hmm. That's how companies feel, and that's how the people inside companies feel. In my personal opinion, right now, is they're just holding on for dear life. And there are some people that are moving with the wind and they're moving as fast as the wind and they're changing their mindset when it comes to what is work. They're changing their mindset when it comes to what roles do people play? What skills do I need? But I'd say more than 50% of companies, and I'm gonna, per, I'm gonna call out a geography here in the US, because it's different. If I didn't do, if I didn't say that, mm -hmm. I would be doing a disservice to some countries. 50% at least of companies in the US, that's how the people are within those companies. And that's how the companies are, is they're holding on for dear life. They're holding on to status quo. Uh, when someone says, when are things gonna return to normal? That's a huge, that's a great example. Like what, stop asking like, I did a huge video about this last year that just one day I got so frustrated. I'm like, I'm not answering that question any longer. Like if you <laughs> that's don't- my closing realize, That's my closing question for you. Come oh, on. yeah. Like if you don't realize the fact that things are, that we're now in a new normal, like you said, or a now normal, like things aren't returning to the way that they were. And that's not bad, okay? But there are gonna be parts of life that are gonna return to the way they were and return better. And that's gonna be great. But some of these things that are, things I've been trying to get rid of in my career for 25 years that now are gone. Like I have to have a wet signature on a document <laughs> and I have to have a paper based file cabinet of all of those wet signatures. Like I've, we've been trying to get rid of that for 25 years in HR. Like now it's gone. Is it going to go back to the way it was? No, it, it, I hope not. It won't. There's, there's no reason for it to. So, you know, all that being said, I think that it's really, really important to, you know, to keep in mind that we're living in this now, we're living in this whole world of this new normal, now normal, and that organizations, those people that are holding on, they have to upskill. 
they have to unlearn back to what I said before, and they have to have the mindset. Yep. They have to have the mindset to do that. Otherwise, the storm's going to take them away. So I'm going to wrap up my line of questioning anyway. Um, taking us back to the, I, I really like how you started us off today with the dual pandemics, which I never thought of it that way, but it is a reality. But one of those pandemics, actually the COVID, actually shifted us physically as people and as corporate. Um, that remoteness, how does that, how does that change in the future on how, yeah, I know we're not gonna require as many people to come in, that type of thing. But a lot of what you talked about, you know, with checking in on your kids on a daily basis as opposed to a coworker, how does that affect that remoteness um, affect me and my psychological, I guess, health as a coworker? Yeah, brilliant question, Rich. Um, have you ever heard of the concept that people use called lift and shift? No. So when we think about lift and shift, we basically take something, we lift it up and shift it to a new thing, a new place. Mm -hmm. Really what happened, if you think about COVID, if we go back to your specific question, all we did was lift it and shift it. So why are kids having trouble learning online? Because all I did was basically take the courseware and the physical teacher, right? The physical teacher. And what did I do? I shifted it to a point where, okay, now it's remote. Okay. I didn't build in new interactive ways to interact with my classmates. I didn't build in ways to make sure that people uh, cameras were on so that I could look into their eyeballs and make sure that they were engaged. Uh, I didn't have the infrastructure to make sure that every low income family had the internet access needed exactly. to be able to partake in these activities. I couldn't even feed people in some cases. So if you think about that at work, I did the exact same thing. I took things that were being done a certain way. Did I have, to, it, it, once again, this goes back to the whole concept of Y2K to Workforce 2020. Was <laughs> I ready? Yeah, I wasn't ready. Was school ready? Schools haven't changed in 40 years, 50 years. I was gonna say, you should keep pushing that number up. Yeah, were, were they ready? No, not at all. Like, why are they having such a hard time getting restarted? Because they, they were that far behind. We had completely not in, invested in our infrastructure from an education standpoint. We have completely not invested in our infrastructure when it comes to the concept of how do I work and live this way? Now, did we, is the pendulum swing way too far? Totally, but it's gonna come back in the middle. And what's so important, it, Rich, back to that whole concept of lift and shift is really all I did it was focused, if I had to focus on Maslow's hierarchy of needs tied to this new world, it was all about survival. And I was just hoping at a minimum that I was getting people connected. Does that make sense? I was hoping at a minimum that I was getting people connected. I wasn't doing anything to build connection. And those, that, those two words are really important and really strong to answer your question. Connected means, oh, cool. Now you're in your town, I'm in my town, we're doing this interview, okay? Connection means that I'm feeling an emotional connection to you that I, when I hang up, quote unquote, just like I used to, if I walked away from you out of the cafeteria or the water cooler, I felt some level of satisfaction. I felt some level of engagement. I felt some level of, wow, I really like that rich guy. I'd love to talk to him again. If all I focus is on the connected part, I have none of that. And that right there, that's the chasm, the emotional chasm that's missing. Our emotional aftertaste, if I could, of a connection-based interaction 
versus our emotional aftertaste of a connected conversation are two different things. And that's where we are right now. We're caught in the middle. We're in a bubble, kind of. So what I'm hearing you say is that, I mean, we, we were every company, every person was forced to react, right? And that's pretty much all we did. We reacted, threw things in place so that we could survive, as you said. What are you seeing in companies as being proactive, right? So the things that you were just talking about, yes, you know, we can talk to one another now, but what are those things I need to provide the company and the employees to feel connected, to, to actually make this now norm to be better than what it was even when we were in the same building together? Yeah, I mean, Rich, there, I mean, uh, this is going to sound really goofy, but, you know, I used to have a physical experience and a digital experience. Mm -hmm. I used to have a physical experience where someone was responsible for the health club and the cafeteria and a digital experience, which looked like a link farm of a bunch of links you know, that someone in IT was responsible for. Yep. I had two experiences. And, and uh, there is no more physical and digital. It's one. I, you know, it's just a question of where do I experience it from? So what organizations are doing is they're separ not separating those two things into like, okay, here's the physical experience, here's the digital experience, and they're different. It's one experience. It's just a question of WFH, which isn't work from home, it's work <laughs> from here. And that here could be anywhere, but it needs to feel the same. Now, is that ever, is it ever going to be, I'm not going to, you know, I can't touch your skin, yep. Rich, over a connection like this yet. I'm not sure I'll shake hands with you ever again, Jason. Yeah, and not sure you'd want me to touch <laughs> your skin, right? But, you know, it, is this ever going to replace the hug? Is it ever going to replace a handshake? Maybe, maybe not. Yeah. You know, is there still going to be a need for that? Maybe, maybe not. I will tell you that there is a generational whole component of this as well, though. That, you know, when I call people, I have two teenagers. When I call people, the first thing they say to me is, why are you calling them? Like, whether I'm calling my mom, whether I'm calling Jess, uh, why are you calling? Why? Uh, the, I mean, they'll look at my, like, my calls. Like, why did you call them? I was like, why not? Like, you could have gotten it done much easier than that. So this whole concept is, you know, there's another dimension, which is the multiple generations of people working together, where, you know, all of us are like, oh, my God, I can't have a water cooler conversation. And, oh, what about the tequila, you know, that, you know, in the, in the break room after work? That's right, the beer you know? cart. Yeah, and you've got other people who are like, that's not, I don't want that. You know, like, that's not what I want. So what are companies doing? They're looking at designing for, you know, I don't want to get too deep into this, but it's human-centered design, design thinking, and it's tied to personas. Okay, and the persona is really not about what job do I do, but who I am and what I want. And if companies truly are proactive versus reactive, as you mentioned, and are thinking forward-looking, they're designing now for what that needs to look like into the future. And that's, I mean, and that's where, you know, we do all of our work every single day of my life. I spend working with organizations designing what their now of work looks like. But I don't do that based on a book. I do that based on how their people want to work going forward and well, how they think their people are going to work going forward. That's, that's exactly right. And the nature of what that company does, the nature yeah. of what the company is. Yeah. And you so. can't, you can't do some of that stuff with uh, uh, manufacturing based work. You know, we're, you know, which is totally cool. You don't have to, you know, but this whole concept of every organization in the world doing the same thing for everyone is dead. It has to be personalized. It has to be B to me based on how I work, how I live, how I want to feel and what I expect from the organization. 